Hi everyone, my name is Pavel and I create VFX for People Can Fly. In the past year or two, uh, me and my colleagues, uh, we work on the Vertex Animation uh, Textures Pipeline. We explored that because we wanted to find a way how we can transfer complex geometry from Houdini into the game engine. For example, we try to use clustering, uh, rigid bodies, uh, destruction, and some detailed fluid splashes. And during this experiment that we found it's not only cheap in terms of performance, but you can also achieve some really good results with these uh, techniques. So in this presentation, I'd like to show you a few practical examples of looped animation that we took from Houdini, and maybe you can find the usage in your project. Uh, there will be some concept work, but we're still trying to improve on some of the techniques. So if you have any input after the presentation, feel free to just approach us and we can have a chat. So to give you an idea how the VATs work, uh, in this video, Houdini is um, allowing us to move the vertices on uh, all axes, which is the X, Y, Z, and Houdini is actually saving the position of those axes uh, for the grid on, on the left um, for all directions. However, the grid on the right, it's only going up and down, and Houdini saves the uh, height coordinates only to the blue channel. So usually, if you want to animate it on bones and skeletal meshes, you're probably going to have this on the CPU. However, with the VAT method, you can unload from your CPU and put it in the GPU instead. So this flag is a very simple VAT soft body um, animation with a loopable, loopable flag in the game engine. And because of its simplicity, simplicity, we wanted to try if we might be able to transfer the animation into VATS and make it behave exactly like we have a simulation in Houdini. So the whole process was straightforward. And after this test, we started experimenting with more complex ideas, trying to implement it in Niagara using dynamic parameters uh, into our workflow allowed us to experiment with a few concept ideas that we had in mind. So this animation is actually a loopable 100 frames and it has two textures that come with it, which is the position and rotation map uh, that we actually take from Houdini. And the size of those textures is 900 by 100. So as you can see, this is the Houdini graph for that uh, flag. I think it's quite simple. Uh, the first part uh, over there is just a mesh creation where I actually take the grid, I uh, subtract the shape to just create a little bit more interesting uh, geometry. Then we're having a remesh. In the remesh, I'm just trying to create um, geometry that's going to be a little bit better with the, for the cloth simulation. And then I'm just running this through the Vellum solver, adding some pop wind and some noise uh, animation. Mm -hmm. Then we go in, into the make loop node. Uh, make loop is actually part of the side effects uh, labs plugins. But I'm going to talk about this in the next few slides. And then I'm just having the export node, which I'm going to plug in into the, um, into the uh, VAT, uh, VAT node in the out section of Houdini. So here's another example. The idea is exactly the same as with the flag, um, but the animation is actually on a, a little bit larger scale. And there are some parameters in Niagara. So the animation can use a frame offset to create a random star point of the animation on all pieces. And you can also slow it down slightly or speed it up to make it difficult to spot the similarities uh, on that animation. And next, let's have a look at the setup. <coughs> So again, I think it's quite simple. First, we're starting with a grid. Um, on that section there, I'm actually creating the position for the uh, holes and for the pinpoints that I'm going to use. I'm using Boolean. I'm using Remesh to create very simple, uh, sorry, better mesh for the cloth simulation. And inside of the Vellum solver, I'm just having a pop wind to add some random um, animation for the cloth and the direction for the wind as well. So I think this technique might be really good if you have a lot of instances in a scene and you just want to randomize them, which you can uh, use the dynamic parameter in Niagara. And when exporting VATS, you need to have a side effects uh, labs plugin installed, as you will need to access the uh, VATS node. Uh, overall, the side effects 
Labs plugin, it contains many useful nodes, especially for us in games. But I noticed that a lot of people in film start using them uh, as well. The next step is to add a VAT node the, into the out section of Houdini. So it's actually there. So once you activate the plugin, you go to shells and you try and find the side effects lab. You can, um, it's going to appear on your shells. And then you're going to have a, an icon which is going to be update toolset. If you don't have this installed, uh, you can just click it and install it. Your Houdini, Houdini is going to restart. And then all the side effects labs nodes starting to appear in your, uh, in your version. So once you activate it, you just go into the uh, out section. You can press tab and call the vertex animation textures. You plug in your export node into the sub path, and if you're doing uh, that for the first time, you can just e export with the default settings and see if you'll be able to import that into the game engine. So this is the last uh, simple example I want to show you um, how you can create plants, which you can add gameplay elements to it. So I've added some sports VFX, uh, some gradient uh, emissive color, and also randomized the animation speed and scale over time in Niagara. We could create simple logic and make the plants to animate faster uh, based on the player position. Uh, same with the sports. As the player gets closer, we could release the sports and damage the player while increasing the intensity of that uh, gradient emissive. And here is the setup for this. Uh, the workflow overall is uh, very similar to the previous examples. The whole animation fits into 100 frames, which you can offset and randomize in Niagara with a dynamic uh, parameter. In the following slides, uh, Christian will talk about the example that he prepared for this presentation. And this will be a little bit more complicated setup with a few ideas what you could achieve with the soft body techniques. So, uh, hi everyone. Uh, at first I want to mention that it's my first presentation, so I am a bit stressed, but uh, let's start. I want to share with you some, some techniques that we developed in the last time. So, yeah, hey, I'm Christian, and now I want to show you how we can extend the techniques that uh, Pavel uh, just showed to you. And basically with uh, the VAT textures, uh, you can also export uh, baked destruction simulations from Houdini. And uh, the baked simulation is an excellent approach, but with it comes a lot of limitations like uh, low flexibility and uh, repetitiveness, because since the entire movement and uh, geometry is saved in textures, it looks uh, the same every time. So. We are looking at a more flexible solution that would allow to incorporate the randomness and adaptation to different scenarios. And we come with, with a solution to use uh, VAT textures only at the beginning stage of uh, destruction, where we basically build the geometry using it. And uh, I want to play this video actually right now. Uh, the entire simulation is driven by particle system. That's, uh, what you see here, this is a Niagara particle system. Uh, and uh, using such approach with particles opened many new doors on our way to experiment and try to push things further. And uh, now I want to show you how the effect uh, was born from uh, our explorations of this technique. Basically, uh, we're using a sphere projection technique where each piece of a fractured geometry is built from a sphere that is projected on that particular mesh. Uh, I can play the video actually, sorry. And uh, here you can see, basically it looks like this, that we have a, a sphere that is marked as a purple color here. And this is basically the geometry of this sphere uh, projected on a target piece, which is uh, uh, represented by the green color here. And you can see that by just doing it, we are able to uh, take the vertices from a sphere and each chunk will have the same uh, count of vertices. So with this, we will be able to use the, the VAT uh, technique that uh, Pavel showed you uh, before. So. Um, 
and the information how far the, the vertex uh, should travel in this direction that you can see is represented by the yellow arrow is uh, basically stored in the, in the VAT texture. Mm. Yeah, sorry, but because it's, it's kind of hard to, for me to describe this, but uh, basically we are wrapping each piece of a fractured geometry with a sphere. So we can say at the end that uh, the entire object, object is reproduced from just one sphere. Basically, when you, when you do such a thing, you almost always use a, a different static meshes for every piece of uh, this fractured geometry. But uh, with this approach, you will have only one uh, static mesh imported to the engine, which is just a sphere. So that's, that's the core idea of this, uh, this technique. And here you can see that uh, the direct projection doesn't produce a perfect result. You can basically see... Uh, uh, sorry, it will play again. You can basically see that the direct projection for, from a sphere works this way that uh, we basically calculate the minimum distance to the, to the target geometry. And uh, you can see the uh, video will play in a while. Uh, this uh, this issue is here, uh, where when we have the, the hard uh, angles between uh, between the edges, and uh, we were uh, looking to a solution how to solve that because it was it was kind kind of a challenge to uh, to you know to, to rebuild that, and we've come with a, with a solution. You can see it here. We have a first step when we have a direct projection on the target. This is where we are attacking the, the target uh, for, for, from a sphere geometry. Then we have a second step, which is uh, basically it, it works this way that we have uh, like oh sorry basically it works this way that uh, we're not uh, projecting directly from sphere to a target piece. Uh, we're doing something like uh, intermediate projection, where we have uh, the step two basically describes it here. We first project it directly, then scale it up, smooth the geometry uh, out a little bit. And then we have the, the better point to reproduce this piece again. So you can see that the, the third final step is like uh, a much more accurate uh, reproduction. When you compare the uh, green, uh, the geometry that is marked by green color to this uh, final piece from uh, step three, you can see that uh, we can say basically that we, we achieved uh, 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 a good result. And here you can see how with a single sphere we can iterate on every piece of the geometry. Uh, it's kind of hard to grasp uh, when, when you look at it probably, but you can imagine that every piece uh, represented here, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a part of a fractured mesh. So basically when you fracture a mesh to 10 pieces, Sorry, but uh, each piece will be represented by this single uh, fragment. And uh, we basically iterate on this fractured object. Uh, we iterate on every piece, and inside this loop, we're using just a single sphere input that is uh, projected on this target piece that is uh, currently in, in, the, in the iteration. So, uh, yeah, that's how it works. You can see how, how flexible the sphere is that... Sorry, because I didn't play the video. You can see that uh, we're using just a sphere with about uh, 642 vertices, and we are able to reproduce every piece here almost perfectly. Of course, you can see, for example, here, uh, it doesn't quite uh, match uh, perfectly, but, uh, you know, of course, with this technique comes uh, a lot of limitations, but... Uh, it's, it, it can be a, a, your, your another arsenal to, to do such, uh, such things. And basically, that's how uh, the process of reprodu reproducing structure of uh, fractured geometry looks like. Uh, once we have specific frame of uh, that animation assigned to each particle, the last step is to move each particle to the correct uh, position using Houdini data. It works basically, I don't know if you can see that, but we have uh, a red dots here. Uh, these are basically uh, particles. Sorry, because it's quite a kind of, uh, probably because of the light. 
And it works this way. It works this way that uh, we basically fracture this uh, mesh in Houdini. And uh, then we assigned each frame of the bat textures to every particle by index. And uh, yeah, the question is how we reproduce this uh, geometry inside uh, Niagara. Uh, we basically have a really simple tool. We are exporting the uh, vector data from uh, Houdini uh, in HLS. Uh, we convert this to HLSL. And in Niagara, we are able to uh, reproduce basically position of each, uh, of each piece you can see that we can match then, uh, the entire geometry. Uh, so it's kind of awesome because, uh, in fact, these uh, chunks here, these pieces are uh, spheres, uh, like, like I showed you before. Um, yeah, and uh, why particles? Yeah, because uh, basically with, uh, with baked destructions ca comes a lot of limitations. Like, for example, when you simulate something inside Houdini, um, you basically have, for example, simulation prepared to, for on the on the flat ground, and you can't use it basically in different scenarios. Like, uh, uh, for example, when you have something like stairs or uh, uneven terrain, and we are looking for a solution where we have uh, when we can simulate at runtime. And uh, with Niagara, uh, we only basically care about this reproduction at the beginning, and then everything simulates uh, at real time. So we have collisions and, and other things like that. Can you speak to the microphone? Oh, sorry, guys. C can you can you heard what I was talking about previously? You're pointing out to your microphone. Yeah, but, but every, sorry, sorry. I, it's my first talk, but uh, have you heard what I was talking previously, or, or it was just a... Uh, we heard it, but... Okay, okay, sorry guys. And uh, yeah, here you can see basically that's uh, all the asset you need to reproduce uh, this, this kind of uh, uh, fractured uh, geometry in Niagara, or you can even do it in, in other uh, uh, scenarios. But basically, here you can see that we have a material instance that uh, Pavel was talking about previously. Uh, it uses the VAT uh, soft body uh, function in it. And this is, this is like uh, the core idea here. This, uh, what you can see here, it's just a sphere. So we use this as sphere. And here is a position texture uh, where we, with this uh, texture, we can deform each vertex of this sphere to match the topology of, uh, of the chunks that uh, I was uh, showing you in the previous slide. So basically, almost any, when you look uh, like how other people approach this kind of situation is that they will import each uh, piece probably as a separated uh, static mesh. And uh, here we have just the sphere, yeah. And uh, now I want to, uh, now I want to make a brief breakdown of this effect and uh, yeah, to create a lightning effect, we can just uh, randomly match particles to pairs of two, uh, where one particle is uh, a source and the other is the target. Then we can basically calculate uh, the difference between them as well as uh, the distance. So basically when we subtract uh, the vector of a target piece and uh, the source piece and the target piece, we will have the direction uh, from one to another. And then we are using it to basically adapt dynamically this red line, which is basically a sprite here. Uh, and uh, of, co of course, we also, with this distance calculated, we are able to stretch it dynamically between them. So you can see that uh, they are almost like uh, attached, stick together. And uh, yeah. So we, we have also some, some kind of sparks here. This is like a, a simple uh, detection when this uh, uh, target piece uh, receives the lightning, then we can uh, spawn some particles. And uh, the force, which is what is interesting here, that the force of these uh, green uh, particles is uh, applied this way, that um, the direction of its force is basically uh, pushed toward the, the source piece. So uh, that's kind of kind of cool solution here.
And uh, after we have the object uh, reproduction, we add uh, additional uh, effect like uh, the breeze, the dust and the grass. Mm, these are just uh, standard particles with some forces uh, to add the feeling of depth and uh, ensure it doesn't look, uh, you know, empty. Mm, I made them this, this uh, color here uh, to just uh, exaggerate that we have this kind of different layers because basically, I will go to the next slide. Here you can see the, the final effect uh, in its glory. Uh, there's kind of a lot of data sharing in this emitter because uh, if you would uh, go inside Niagara and see how it looks like, we have about uh, 10 emitters there. And uh, yeah, we're thinking how we can approach that because we need to send data from one emitter to the others. And basically, it works this way that we have a one uh, emitter that is a uh, main parent emitter. And from this, the main parent emitter, other emitters uh, are like fetching data. So uh, this way we, have, we can, for example, spawn uh, particles like this uh, lightning or, or anything else uh, on, on, on the specific events. And uh, here you can see one of the pr prototypes of this effect uh, on an enemy. Uh, at uh, the core, these are just a couple of spheres with uh, proper setup, as I showed you, uh, placing specific positions. And uh, yeah, sorry guys, I was a little nervous. It was my first time, but uh, after seeing all of this, uh, yeah, pay attention to every rock in the games because uh, what looks like uh, a rock may be actually something else in practice. So that's all from me. Uh, now Pavel will talk about different VAT methods uh, and its usage. Thanks. Okay, look, that example, I think it was complicated, to be fair, and when we actually showed the technique to our team, they kind of needed a couple hours for us to just go through it and explain what's happening. So me and Christian will be hanging around here, and if there, after this presentation, if you want to have a chat, uh, we can just walk you through it and uh, answer any questions that you might have. So another VAT technique is dynamic remeshing. Um, soft bodies were the first that we looked into, and it seems like the easiest method to experiment with. Then we decided to create some splashes in Houdini using the dynamic remeshing method. Uh, here we've got a couple simulations, um, and we just wanted to recreate a liquid-like behavior in the, in the game engine. So VATs actually were perfect for this. Uh, as we wanted this effect to be cheap in terms of performance, uh, we found that splashes might be a good choice for a very system uh, that we have in the project. We could use it for some water splashes and any lava effect and in places that actually require you to have a liquid-like behavior. We try to make our Houdini setups clean in case someone else has to open it and work with it. So on the left, I create the uh, velocities uh, for the uh, for the splashes, uh, and actually the, those actually control uh, the, the the whole splashes. Uh, then I plug it into the dot network, and the last part is just the engine export. Everything is controlled with with the level all details and the movement and how it looks. Um, it's only managed with one node, and that's actually this attribute vote, which is in the velocity section. So here is the footage taken directly from the game engine with uh, isolated splashes and I also recolored them. Uh, hopefully this will give you an idea of what's achievable with this VAT method and in the next slide I will talk a little bit more about uh, some concepts and how you can combine um, different VAT methods into a single effect. So this is another example that Christian uh, have done combining, uh, whoops, So this is the, um, another example that Christian present, uh, that done for the, for the presentation, combining various VAT methods and also taking the tools from Houdini, kin, uh, KinFX and, uh, yeah, and different VAT techniques. So this is a complex example, so we won't be going into many details, but if you'd like to learn more, again, me and Christian will be just 
hanging around here or just you can catch us outside and we can have a chat. So for the bat animation we use the KinFX. It's designed to have a procedural system in mind in case you want to swap, swap the bat for any other creature and KinFX will update the mesh and the rig for you. The model of the bat has a var various animated states. We wanted to blend between them in Niagara. Uh, usually you would need bones and, um, and the rig for the 3D model, but in this case you can export uh, the bat using the soft body with the frame ranges and you can recreate the animation using dynamic parameters in Niagara. Can you show previous uh, slide for the scan? Uh, one more time. Sorry. With the, with the yes, yes. Okay. Yeah, no worries. I mean, if you want those slides, actually, you can message me. Uh, I'm going to leave my uh, email address and I'm happy to just send it to you if you want to recreate it. I mean, the whole idea behind this presentation is to you recreate very simple example like just a flag. Uh, see if you can actually import it into game engine. And from there, you have an idea how to work with VATS and you can experiment with the different methods. And so for the web, we use the clustering technique, which is soft body. And I think it was just a really good choice um, for this. And we decided then what frames of the animation to play in Niagara so we can match our timing with the gameplay elements. And here is the final example. And we we're just trying to create like a, a hive behavior and you can spawn a lot of them. You can see there is a, a bunch of offsets as well, which just gonna you know, hide the similarities between the animation. So in my opinion, currently the VATS methods are amazing, but it comes with a drawback. So the first one is lack of LODs. Uh, the textures cannot become uh, compressed and the meshes need the exact number of verts all the time. The only way at the moment to create another set of mesh um, and the texture would be to... So, right, sorry. So if you're having um, just one texture and one mesh, you're just having one LOD. So to create other LODs, you have to go back to Houdini, come up with a lower resolution uh, of the vertices and the texture size, and that's how you can switch between LODs. So we're hoping that maybe you know, you're gonna take the flag example, and maybe next year we're gonna meet here, and you're gonna give us a couple ideas about the LODs or something that you discovered. Next is the amount of uh, vertices. Um, and frames that we use, so the more the vertices you have, the, the bigger the texture is going to be. And also, it also depends how many frames you have in your animation. The initial setup actually took us some time, and to some time investment, so I think our leads just uh, decided that uh, to give us to us, um, we took quite an amount of time to discover a couple things and come up with a couple uh, R&D examples. So if you're planning to implement uh, DVATs into your projects, just make sure you dedicate enough time um, for the research. And on, but on the flip side, VATS allow us to create complex visuals from Houdini to the game engine and use them in uh, interesting ways. Also, the ability to unload animation, some of the animation from the CPU to the GPU was the big deal. Uh, when we've been starting, we actually uh, used uh, a lot of uh, learning materials from online, and here's the guide by Simon. I believe he still works at the side effects. It was a good starting point if you want to create your first setup. Um, Simon, in his guide, goes through it and explains what to pay attention when exporting and importing VAT assets to the game engine. I think it was just very easy tutorial to follow uh, that will help you understand how the VAT works. Uh, the projects file were included if you want to take a look what's happening under the hood. And yeah, just, you know, go through the tutorial, go through the lessons, and hopefully um, you will manage to import. Because most people having a problem with importing assets into the Unreal Engine. So again, if, you know, you're going to just try it and you won't be able to export, uh, import a single flag into Game Engine, feel free to send me an email and I can walk you through. Uh, thank you so much for attending this presentation. I hope you enjoyed it and you've learned a couple tips and tricks. Feel free to ask me anything after the presentation or maybe just try using, uh, or maybe you just tried using uh, VATS in the past without success. And if you would like to learn more or want us to walk you through the process, you can just approach us and we can have a chat. Do you have any questions?
Uh, sorry if you mentioned it before, uh, but uh, do you compress the VAT texture in the engine or how does that work? Does it cause problems, janky animations, stuff like that? So we don't compress. Uh, Have you tried compressing, see if it's acceptable? It won't work because they come up into the engine as a HDR or uh, vertex displacement textures. So they can't be really compressed. I think maybe there is a way. We just have not discovered it. But we, to be honest, we're just very deep in those uh, vats. And we're going to be exploring them in the future. But at the moment, you know, to order to create a bit more uh, optimized version, you have to go back to Houdini, reduce your vert count. And you're going to have a smaller texture. Or just reduce the animations, for example. You can just do that. And, and that way, you can have it a little bit more optimized. But to be honest, those textures are quite small. The flag one has about 100 frames. Uh, the texture was 900 by 100. So it's just tiny, I think. It depends what you're using for, to be honest. Hi. Thank you for, uh, thank you for your talk. Uh, about the compression, uh, is that linear interpolation between uh, keyframes, or did you try to use some kind of uh, Bezier interpolation in between just to reduce the uh, keyframes? Uh, and the second question is, uh, do you load this texture uh, with the level, or you have some kind of a soft reference when you uh, address the, the VFX event and then you load the texture? Uh, okay, so I'm just going to answer the second one because I think I already forgot about it. So hold to the mic because you're going to just repeat the first question if you can. Um, no, you just import those textures normally like you would import anything else. Um, Not import, but lo uh, load it in memory. I'm sorry, I don't think I understand. Uh, like streaming, do you stream it? Do, do you load it in memory with the level, or when you actually spawn the particle? Uh, I think you can do it in both ways, to be honest. So, because you cannot use MIP maps, you cannot uh, because it's not power of two, right? Mm -hmm. And you cannot compress it somehow. So, like, is it always in memory those textures? So you are limited in the amount of unique VFX that you're gonna use on this level. I don't think we went that deep with this, to be fair. But in terms of um, MIP maps and stuff, you can probably put them into a big atlas at the end of the project and atlas it together, I'd imagine, with all the other assets that you might have in the game. Ah, and keep in memory all the time, right? I think so. I'm not sure. I'll have to get back to you at some point. Uh, no problem. Yeah. Well, sorry, what was the first question? Uh, the, the first question was, uh, is that linear interpolation in between? Of oh, got it. Right. So. What you're doing, you're just plugging, you're just changing the display frames in the VAT material. So you plug in your dynamic parameter. And with dynamic parameter, you can just um, change it to curves and you can animate it on the curves instead. So you can have a, a little bit more interesting animation. Also, with the. Go ahead. Because, yeah, it did. I, I forgot actually about it, but uh, the way how it actually works is uh, uh, when you have this. Uh, that uh, function yeah, that I was previously showing you guys, it's like uh, you can have the one piece and the second one on the second frame. So you basically have uh, two coordinates of this texture, uh, with one and two, and we basically make a layer between them. And we connect this uh, output to the word position offset, and that's, that's basically it, if it answers your question. Yeah, but well, did you try uh, any more complex? complex uh, interpolation in between, so you will have those like uh, more smooth interpolation, not like uh, without stepness, so you can use less less keyframes and less uh, rows. Yeah, but uh, you are talking bit about uh, an animation itself, a blending, that it stops, uh, you know, just uh, we have a sharp stop at that animation, or you are talking about like shape uh, blending, shape smoothing between mm -hmm. different... Uh, Learning in between frames, so you can use less frames, but the animation itself will be uh, a same smooth. Oh, oh yeah, sorry, I get it. it it's basically with uh, VAT uh, 3 that was, uh, you know, uh, incorporated some time ago, you have this automatically. 
yeah, you can just click a checkbox that you want to blend between frames and yeah, it looks like this. You can basically export animation at 24 frames and you have uh, basically blending between uh, specific frames. So that's Probably it. you have to reinvent the, the mid maps for one texture so that you just keep some frames on a distance and that will be analog mid Yeah, we're just going to wait a year. You're going to come back to us and we're going to have a chat. Right, another idea for the uh, dynamic stuff, for the, sorry, for the dynamic parameters is that you imagine you have a, a bird, for example, and animator gave you animated bird with a different animation, so you have like a takeoff flight and then a landing, for example, and you have this, well, let's say, on 100 frame in dynamic parameter, you can decide with the curve what kind of frames range you want to play at the moment. So the next step for us will be probably creating like a, a little bit more intelligent system, like a, a some animals or maybe a bird. Look, I get it. I mean, vats are a little bit painful. But to be fair, once you just import one or two meshes into the engine, you will get an idea. But please, start with the soft bodies. This is like the simplest way that you can start with. If you're gonna start with dynamic remeshing, you're just gonna give up and you're gonna meet me Next year you're going to punch me, so start with the soft bodies. All right, thank you so much. Feel free to catch me afterwards. <laughs>